Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. It's been a pleasure to be here and give this talk. So you already know the title of the talk. The Provo out, to OK. Thank you. And the title of today's talk is Provably Efficient Adaptive Scheduling with Parallelism Feedback. So I'm Yuxiong He. This is joint work with Charles Lysis and Kunal Agarwal at MIT and Wen Jinsu Hongyangsun at MTU. So in parallel and distributed system, adaptively parallel job have become more and more popular. This job has their parallelism change along job's execution time. In shared memory multiprocessor systems, many data parallel and adaptive and dynamic multi-threaded jobs become to, um, belong to this category. For example, Hypothesis Fortune, Nestle, ZPL, Silk Plus Plus, Microsoft Task Parallel Library, Sound Fortress, Intel Threat Building Block, and so on. Well, in distributed systems, uh, many services have their demand change periodically. These are all examples of adaptively parallel jobs. So to schedule a adaptive parallel job, we may use static scheduler, which allows each job a fixed number of processors. But the issue here is obvious that it may result in wasting resources when the job demand is low, or it can defer in job's execution time when the job's demand is high. What's the solution here? That's where adaptive scheduling comes into the place. So an adaptive scheduler can change the number of processors allotted to a job during job's execution. When the job demand is high, it can increase allotment. When the job demand is low, it can decrease allotment. Uh, in our study, we study adaptive scheduling in non-clearant context. It's to say scheduler does not know any information on job's future. We choose it because it's more close to the practice where Job information is not known to the scheduler in advance. So this talk, will, I will, in this talk, I will present ideas and algorithms for non-clearant adaptive scheduling of parallel jobs on multiprocessor systems. Let me start from the job model. We model job as DAG is a direct asynchronous graph. So each DAG could have two parts, nodes and edges. So node is a unit time task, and edge just represents <coughs> dependency between nodes. There are two important properties for a job. One is its work. That's just the total number of nodes in the DAG. It's also the time to execute the job on one processor. We use T1 to represent the work. Another important parameter here is a span. That's the length of the longest path in the DAG. As we can see, that's a red line over there. It's also the time to execute the job on infinite number of processors. We use T infinity to represent the span. One thing to notice here is as when the job release, its DAG is not known. So all we know at the beginning is that blue node over there the DAG will unfold itself during the execution. And another piece of information from the job model is when the parallel of the job change, sorry, during the job's execution, the parallelism of the job could change along the time. So to schedule parallel jobs on multiprocessors, we use a two-level scheduling model. In the Kernel level, this OS allocator, it allows processors to jobs. And in 
for each individual job, they have its task scheduler. It schedules those tasks to the allotted processors. OK, here, why do we choose two level scheduling instead of one level? The main motivation is to reduce scheduling overhead because with one level scheduling, each task's schedule needs to go through the kernel level scheduler, which may involve a system call. That's overhead we don't want to pay here. If we think about two level scheduling in adaptive context, here is, here I will present what's going on there. So jobs allotment will change. This change is based on scheduling quantum. So at the beginning of a scheduling quantum, OS allocator will interact with task scheduler. Their interaction works as follows. So the task scheduler estimates jobs desire, which is a reflection of jobs parallelism for the next quantum. Then it sends this desire to OS allocator. OS allocator will decide processor availability based on the desire and scaling policy. Finally, the allotment is a minimum of desire and processor availability. Here we can see in the adaptive context that task scheduler has one extra functionality, which is to estimate jobs desire. So we are talking about scheduling non clivant context. That means the task scheduler has no information of jobs future. However, here it needs to estimate jobs desire for the future. So this talk will, in this talk, I will describe, okay, how this work out and how would that part eventually contribute to the entire system's performance. As for performance metrics, we use mixed spine and mean response time. So mixed spine is just the time to complete all jobs in the job set, and mean response time is average response time of all jobs in the job set. The so response time is just its completion time minus its release time. Instead of using absolute value, we conduct competitive analysis. It's to compare our scheduler with offline optimal scheduler. If for every job set, we see in the worst case, the a scheduler A is less than or equal to C times the mixed spine generated by the offline optimal scheduler, then that scheduler A is C competitive for mixed spine. Of course, the concept is similarly applicable to mean response time analysis. So with all of the objective in mind, what are the key questions for this problem and what are the challenges we face when we develop adaptive two-level scheduler? There are two parts. In the task scheduler part, so how does task scheduler estimate desire? In non-clarion context, task scheduler does not know jobs parallelism for the future. The future parallelism may not depend on its past. Also, job parallelism could change many times during a scheduling quantum. So design estimation is a hard problem. Well, on the other side, for OS allocator, how does it make processor allotment to guarantee system performance? There are many cases where the total desire of jobs could be larger than the total number of processors. How would I balance the interest among these jobs to achieve good system performance? So in this talk, I will present our solution to these challenges and questions. Start from task scheduler. We know that task scheduler's um, objective is to ensure efficient execution of individual job. However, ultimately, it wants to contribute to the overall system performance. So how would overall system performance is reflected from the performance of individual job? So the first question I will address in this part is, what performance metrics should adapt scalar use? Then it follows with the key question of how does a non clearance task scheduler estimate desire? So in that part, 
I will present our adaptive task editor, a greedy, and use history-based feedback. But interesting point is, even when the future is not related to the past, it still guarantees individual job perform well. So in the OS allocator part, I will start to introduce our OS allocator red and combining red with Adaptive Task Scheduler A Greedy, we obtain two level scheduler GRAD. Here, I will show that GRAD is order one competitive with respect to make span for arbitrary job set, and is order one competitive for mean response time for batched jobs. GRAD is a first non clarion adaptive scheduler offering such guarantees. In the in the analysis of GRAD, I would also like to point out what are the desirable properties of OS allocator eventually lead to the good performance of the two-level system. Sorry. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. So for make spine, the constant is 5. And for mean response time, the constant is around 5.2. Later, the, the exact constant will show there. And so finally, I've talked about so much about non clarion scheduler. Then what if the scheduler has some information of job? Would that help to improve system performance? So I will talk one example where we have some partial information of job and how a scheduler could make use of those information. I'll start from task scheduler. First is what performance metrics your task scheduler use? Most intuitive one is to minimize time. Let's see the only purpose of task scheduler is try to <coughs> minimize the job's completion time. Then what I should do is, let's always request a huge number of processors, and I'll get what's ever available. The problem is obvious that if job's pattern is significantly smaller than the available processors, the job could waste a large number of processor cycles, which might be better used by other jobs. So using completion time as the only measure isn't sufficient. Since we talk about waste here, what, what if we just use waste as a matrix? It turns out that if we just use waste as matrix, then I would only request for one processor all the time. The problem is obvious that the job will just run on one processor and never waste any processor cycle. Okay, that's a good part. The bad part is the job could execute slowly even when they have huge parallelism. So we know that using execution time and all waste as only matrix isn't sufficient. What we really want is adaptive task gallery should minimize both. So now, we have known its performance metrics. What should we do? How does a non clarion task scheduler estimate jobs desire? So I, will I believe there are many possible answers to this question. And I will present ours, which is a greedy, our adaptive task scheduler. As I mentioned, it uses history-based feedback. So the job's desire for the current quantum will be based on its desire, its behavior at previous quantum. And in terms of the task allocation scheme, uh, this is simple. I just use a greedy scheduling. Basically, if the total number of allotted processors is less, than, is less than the total number of ready tasks I have, then every of these processors just take one ready task to run. In the other case, then 
all of the ready, ready tasks will take a chance to run. So that's a greedy part. And a greedy guarantees to complete job with short time and small waste, even when the future is not related to the past. I will quantify the short time and small waste part shortly. So before I zoom into the a greedy algorithm, I, I need to define the behavior of a job. So a behavior of job is depending on processor usage and allotment. For, um, so here, you may notice I start to use like step instead of quantum. So in the presentation, I assume that the scaling quantum lines is just for one for simplicity. But it could, but in for the real a greedy algorithm, it covers more general case and the lines of scaling quantum should be large enough to amortize scaling overhead. Okay, so back to the job's behavior. According to processor usage, a job is efficient if processor usage is equal to allotment. But if processor usage is less than the allotment, the job is inefficient. According to processor allotment, a job is satisfied if the allotment is equal to desire. Otherwise, if allotment is less than the desire, the job is deprived. With that, here is a greedy algorithm. It's a very simple algorithm. It mainly covers four cases. So first, is about, at the beginning, the initial desire will always start from one. If previous quantum is inefficient, then the current desire is half of the previous desire. The reason here is when the previous quantum is inefficient, I have wasted a lot of processor cycles. Then I may have overestimated the desire, therefore I should decrease the desire. When the previous quantum is efficient and satisfied, then the desire should be two times of the previous desire. Here, the previous quantum is satisfied, so I got all I asked for. And it's efficient, so I'm able to effectively use all of the processors I requested. So I should start to think, OK, if I can use more, that's a part of exploring potential parallelism. Then in the first case, if previous quantum is efficient and deprived, then I just keep my desire, doesn't change. Here the previous quantum is efficient. I use all of the processors allocated to it, but notice it's deprived, so it didn't get what it asked for. It has no idea if it's able to use all it's asked for efficiently. Therefore, it remains, keep the desire unchanged. This is a very simple algorithm, but it provides effective parallelism feedback. The, the two is not a magic number at all. In, this is just for simplicity. In the real algorithm, we use a responsiveness parameter. As long as it's greater than one, it will work. Yeah, we tried to do this work on the system uh, 15 years ago. We also doubled and halved. And the reason was we, were, we didn't have a competitive algorithm. We didn't know. Quite how to how to make that go through, but uh, but we had the same sort of objectives in mind, and we were worried about the constant uh, on the competitive algorithm. We were also worried about the operating system overhead. Uh, that is how much how, if you only ask for a little bit, then you're it takes you a long time to ramp up, or else you ask very often, which gets you into an overhead problem. So, exactly. So so we made the. You know, we, and I, I don't know what Convex did on the C2, but it, it had a, some sort of growth algorithm, of course, as well. And 
I don't know whether yeah, we should ask Steve Wallach or somebody what he did there. When the constants are precisely two and one half, you always have a power of two number of processors, which if you had yeah. uh, funnier numbers, you would in a while convert to any number that makes sense. Like you That's true. You never get 17 processors this way. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Whereas if you make D equal two times A, Two work, times. Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, we, we actually tried that bro approach. The last allocation would say, well, you know, I'm or even randomized. Just make yeah, it yeah, get yeah. Yes. So for the agreed performance. The first part is its time. So A greedy guarantees that it completes the job with at most 2t infinity plus log p plus 1 satisfied steps. So we know that t infinity is a critical path. It's also the lower bound to complete a job. The indication here is when there are sufficient processors available, a greedy completes a job in a symptotically optimum time. Well, for the waste part, the waste theorem guarantees that A greedy waste at most order T1 processor cycles. So the waste is a fraction of the total work. What does this two theorem told us is the two aspects important to an adaptive task scheduler. So the time theorem shows that a greedy has a potential to explore in parallelism. So when there are sufficient number of processors, I can complete the job quickly. On the other hand, the waste bound says that A greedy is good at controlling waste. Even when I try to explore in parallelism, I can still guarantee a waste bound over there. Later, when we try to apply A greedy in the two-level scheduling model, and lead to the t system performance, we will see how this two part fit over there. Um, so this slide and next slide is just uh, some ideas on how do we prove the time bound and waste bound of A greedy. This is the time bound. We want to bound the total number of satisfied steps and we know the total number satisfied, satisfied steps could be further divided into inefficient satisfied and efficient satisfied. For the inefficient step, the idea is simple that it, it can make progress on span and it will reduce span by one for each inefficient step. Therefore, the total number of inefficient step is bounded by to infinity. As for the satisfied and efficient step, we are able to bound it <coughs> by the total number of inefficient step and the maximum desire. So why is it so? It's really similar to the case when we use stack operations. Let's say we start from an empty stack. The total number of push will be bounded by the total number of pop and the maximum number of elements could be inside the stack. The idea is very similar here. The only difference is in the stack case, it works linearly. And in this case, it works multiplicatively. And by using that, we can bound the top number set for an efficient step by using t infinity plus log 2p. Here, the, log, the 2p is the maximum desire we could ever get in this case. So we have inefficient step. We have the satisfied efficient step. The total number of satisfied steps is bounded by the sum of these two. That's the idea. And as for the waste, we want to show the waste is at most order T1 of its total work. That's the key observation over there, is to say if we have an inefficient step which, waste, which could potentially waste a lot, then we must have a corresponding efficient step we, whose desire is just half of this inefficient step's desire. And 
if we have that observation, we are able to amortize the waste for the step R to its work done during the previous efficient step. This amortization will lead us to our waste bound. So that's about task scheduler. I will now talk, move to OS allocator to see how do we guarantee overall system performance. So first I'll introduce RED. RED is a combination of round robin and dynamic equal partitioning. We, know, we all know round robin, so when the total number of jobs is greater than total number of processors, RED will just do round robin and allot one processor to each job with an equal slice of time. Well, when the total number of jobs is less than or equal to total number of processors, it applies dynamic equal partitioning. The way dynamic equal partitioning work is it tries to allow each job a fair share of processors unless this job requests for less. If we look at the example here, and we have five jobs and we have 35 processors. Job one and two, they request a small number of processors and, and their requests are satisfied. For job three, four, five, we request a large number of processors and it's above the average the OS allocator count afford to give each of them that much. So they will all get the same number of processors, which is 10, is the average of remaining processors. These jobs are deprived. This is OS allocator. It has two important properties. One is diligence, and another one is fairness. So the diligence part is to say the OS allocator try to make best effort to satisfy as many requests as possible. If under the scheduling of diligence scheduler, if there exists any deprived job, then all of the following three statements are true. First is, all processors are allocated to job. There won't be any idle processors. Second, the total desire is greater than total number of processors, P. Third, that no job will get extra processor than desire. So diligence property basically is the best effort kind of property to ensure efficiency, which I'll show later. And as for the fairness, is to say that no job is preferred over another job. And for a fair scheduler, the following two statements are true. First is, Smaller allotment is really the result of smaller desire. If I have my desire, if, if my, I have my allotment less than someone else's allotment, that really is because I desire less than someone else. The second part is all deprived jobs have the same allotment. This is about fairness. Later we'll see that these two properties, the diligence and the fairness, as a key to knock the door of mixed band and mixed mean response time efficiency. Now let's just integrate our A greedy task scheduler and red OS allocator. We obtain our grad to level scheduler. As I just mentioned that here are the performance guarantees for grad. And in the next few slides, I will briefly go through the mixed bind analysis of GRAD and try to say, okay, how do we do the analysis there? And more importantly, what are the important properties for adaptive task scheduler and adaptive OS allocator? So to conduct the mixed bind analysis, we want to compare our scheduler with offline optimal, but in this case, offline optimal is MP hard. So instead, we compare it against the theoretical lower bound. We apply three lower bounds here. First is the maximum release time of all jobs in the job set. 
Second, it is a maximum span of all jobs in the job set. And finally, is a total work divided by P. Okay. Now let's go for the mixed span analysis. Let's assume that job <coughs> K is the last job to complete in the job set. Then the mixed span of the job set is really the release time of job K plus the time taken to complete job K. We know release time of job K and the time taken to complete job K is the total number of satisfied steps plus the total number of deprived steps. What is the number of total number of satisfied steps here? We showed that in the A-Greedish time theorem. That is order t infinity plus log p. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I should use a lighter color. It's order t infinity. It's order t infinity of k, job k, plus log p. Plus one, yes. Right. Yes. So we only need to bound the total number of deprived steps. Here we go. We want to bound the total number of deprived steps. Let's use D to denote the total number of deprived steps for this job K. So according to Red's diligence property, we know that if a time step is deprived for job K, then red must have allocated all processors to jobs. So the total allotment on deprived step is d times of p. At most. Yes, as at most d times of p. Thank you for to be precise. And the all the allotted processors are either working or wasted. So we have the inequality here. Third, for each job, we know its work, and we know its waste is bounded by the order of its work. And according, that's according to a Greedish waste theory. So for the entire job set, we know that the total work plus total waste is really the order of the total work. If we apply this to the inequality at step two, we are able to bound the total number of deprived steps as the order of T1, the total work divided by P. Just bring that back to our analytical tree. Here is what we get. If we look at the leaf, which Sorry, you may, be, may not be able to read. Uh, that's a release time and span of the job K and total work divided by P. The only, only other attribute is log P, while P is a variable independent of the job set. So yes, this, please. This essentially lets Bren scheduling lemma apply to the whole system. Exactly. It's, it's sort of like applying greedy scheduling over the entire system, uh, it's true. But uh, on the other part, we also show that if the task scheduler part use randomized work stealing, the bound could still hold. It's just with different constants. Um, so if we refresh what's happening in this analysis, what are the important properties here? That's a grid time theory and weight theory. For red, it's its diligence property. We can generalize a little bit on this observation. And we will be able to see that the diligence property is critical for OS allocator in order to ensure mixed span efficiency. Let's see we have a diligent OS allocator Y and by coupling in one task scheduler X, its mixed span can be bounded by the task scheduler's waste and satisfied time. It gives us some kind of guideline or 
make to design new make span efficient OS allocator or two level scheduler easier. So as for the mean response time, so we study mean response time for batched jobs. And the mean response time analysis is more complicated here, and I don't have time to cover the entire thing. But I just want to bring out the fact of what are the important things there. Um, I start from a simple example. So let's say we schedule sequential batched jobs on one processor. And if we look at the jobs, we have five jobs. Their work is 1111, like 100. The optimal offline scheduler is just run shortest job first. And the total response time is 114. And the worst algorithm will be to run longest job first. So the response time is 520. Now the question is, we are doing non-clearance scheduling. We can't, we can't know that job's total work before we schedule it. What should we do in the online case? It turns out that the best non clearance deterministic algorithm is round robin. If we schedule the previous case use round robin, the response time will be 124, which is pretty close to the optimum. In fact, it was shown by um, Mawanti, Philip, and Torum in '93 that the round robin is too competitive in this case. What's the indication here? The indication is really that when we want to schedule short job first and we don't know which job is shortest, the best we can do is try to make equal progress for each job and eventually we get there. So, is in the online case, making equal progress can be the best feasible solution. In fact, when we prove our mean response time bound, the fairness property of red is very critical to ensure this bound holds. So the, in, the purpose of the discussion here is to point out the connection of the response time efficient OS allocator with its fairness property. After talking a lot on the theoretical part, this, I just want to discuss a little bit of the, our experimental result. <coughs> so it's collected using simulation. And we test different set of different mix and different type of jobs, like the jobs generated by random DAGs, or the jobs of typical applications, such as fork drawing, mean value analysis, matrix multiplication, and so on. Um, we test the system with 64 to 100, 1,000 number of processors. So here is a mixed band result. So we compare the mixed band produced by grad with their article lower bounds for over 10,000 rounds of job set. The x-axis is a mixed band ratio and the y-axis is a percentage of jobs falling in that category. So this figure shows us that in the worst case, the grad produce, the mix band produced by grad is less than 4.5 times of the optimal. And in average case, is around 1.39 times of the optimal. So what's the Sorry? What is the workload? What is the workload? We use different kind of workload. So one part is to use the workload generated by the doctor, oh, sorry, it's just a name. So there's a parallel workload archive maintained in the web, and we generate some of the workload according to the jobs in the collected from different data clusters. Although those jobs itself are not adaptive, we just match the total work and the critical path over there and apply some of the parallel, um, parallelism change pattern. Please. There's about 300 jobs in the last non-zero bracket. What's all, did somebody look at them and see what their characteristics are? Um, three, uh, which category? 1% of 10,000 oh. 300 jobs. That's, that's how you can start skipping to the pages and looking at them. That, that's a very good point. 
I haven't really get into and see what are the jobs there. Thank you for bringing that out. And for the mean response time. Yes, so the mean response time experiment, again, is to compare this mean response time for, against the theoretical article lower bound. And now the x-axis is the mean response time ratio. And this is a graph we get for mean response time analysis. In the worst case, it's also less than 4.5 times of the optimum. And in the average case, is around 2.37 times of the optimal. So by now, we have discussed a lot on non-clavian scheduling, a very nature question to, uh, to bring out is, what if we have some information <coughs> of jobs? Of course, the job information could have very different form. But here, we'll talk about one kind is that you have one step look ahead on jobs parallelism. You know jobs instantaneous parallelism. That is the number of processors that a job can effectively use as an immediate next step. OK, if we look at this example, all of the green nodes have been executed, and all of the yellow nodes are ready. And for the other part, this just unfolded part of the graph. In this case, the instantaneous parallelism is a total number of ready nodes over there, and it's five. Let's see, if the scheduler knows this instantaneous parallelism is the beginning of scaling quantum, and also this instantaneous parallelism remains constant during a scaling quantum, what we can do is we can have a task scheduler using instantaneous parallelism as feedback. And this task scheduler could produce at most infinity satisfied steps. And we can show that it won't waste any processor cycles. Combine this task scheduler with red OS allocator, let's call it IRED. We show that IRED's make spine and mean response time two competitive for mixed spine, three competitive for mean response time. And compare ARAD with GRAD. And make, pro and make improvement for both mixed spine and mean response time. So where does those, those inf improvement come from? It's basically the accuracy of parallelism feedback. That's the power of having one step Look ahead. Sorry? In this case, no. Actually, the bound we we show for IRED is the existing best bound for online scheduling with respect to mixed bound mirror response bound. Yes, that may not be true. Yeah. So when we, so the implementation that we did was uh, years ago was was one that estimated parallelism because it essentially had all the stealable work in one place. There was a big queue of steal of what amounts to stealable work, and uh, and so it was easy to estimate how much of that there was. Uh, uh, she knows what it's, it's, it's work that it's work that you could either run uh, in the continuation that spawned it, or you could have somebody else pick it up and run it to stay. Um, I'm sort of translating here, but basically it's all yes, all that's the potential true. work that you know is there. Uh, there were also blocked continuations in our system that that become unblocked, and those are also runnable work, and we had yes. a Tried to say, so here's all this work. Maybe it'll stay the same. Maybe it won't. But let's, you know, let's use that. Also estimated how long it took to retire the work. Uh huh. At least on paper. I don't think I don't know if we ever implemented this, but 
and Rich Corey and I came up with a scheme where we estimated how long, you know, how fast we were retiring work, and we would sort of use that, trying to push towards that lower line, towards the IRA line. Uh huh. So, yeah, this is. It's a yeah. real example real of using this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so now I'd like to summarize the work and bring out some open questions here. So this graph includes the topics I presented today. It's task scheduler and OS allocator. The integrating them, we obtain the two-level scheduler and showed some power of information part. And Inform from the other side, I think the important information also include what's important for adaptive task scheduler and OS allocator. In this part, for adaptive task scheduler, <coughs> the waste and satisfy steps. And for OS allocator, the connection between diligence and mixed spine, the connection between fairness and mean response time. So I also worked on other topics in adaptive scheduling. It include like the a greedy as a centralized scheduler. So I also develop a distributed task scheduler and use randomized work stealing and guarantee the same performance as a greedy does. The also part of work studying heterogeneous system with functional heterogeneity means results have different functionalities. And there's a more generalized analytical framework to conduct mean response time analysis for this two-level scheduling. So these are the links to my papers along the area if you are interested. Finally, but not least importantly, is open questions. I think there are a lot of interesting open questions along this line. One interesting area is to explore different strategies in providing parallelism feedback. For example, stabilization of desire. A greedy has a desire oscillate <coughs> even when the final parallelism is fixed. We, it would be desirable to have something which its desire could also stabilize when the parallelism doesn't change. And control-based approach might be able to help here. Another thing is non-Markov model. Our skin used one previous step to decide the future desire. What if we consider more than one? Will a learning skin fit in this paradigm? Also, fully adaptive system. A lot of scaling, scheduling algorithms or resource management systems have a bunch of parameters to tune in order for them to work very well. They need to tune those parameters exactly. However, those parameters could depend on the workload, different type of jobs. So in a very dynamic environment, it would be very valuable to have a fully adaptive system. We which can tune the parameters automatically. Or in other words, we want something which is not only environmental aware, it could be like environment oblivious and work all the way. Another big area is to apply that scheduling in more complex scenario and various context. For example, job could have different priority and dependencies. How would adaptive scheduler be able to adapt to those constraints. And certainly different performance metrics, people are interested in power, energy, and so on. And using that in heterogeneous system is just a big challenge, especially we consider both functional and performance heterogeneity. Another big area is on distributed system, for example, in cloud computing. The elasticity of services is very common and is a big driving force. So the 
resources allocated to a service really should adapt to the change of the demand. This is again an application of adaptive scheduling. That's all about today's talk. Thank you very much and I will answer questions. So, um, one of the things that I wonder about, I mean, this is very good. Thank you. It's, it's somehow, the thing about programs is they're usually run more than once. Very few programs just get run once and never again. And so, if, if we had a way to sort of think about tracking <coughs> <clears throat> the history of an application. Yes. And so that you could, you could it, it's never going to run exactly the same each time, depending upon its inputs and the way it's configured. But if it's run, I can build a profile. Of, I know this job. I know what it's going to do right here. It's going to request a lot, and then it's not going to need much. Then it's going to need a whole lot. Yes. Amount, and so I could build a sort of a historical profile. I would think that that would be something that I could, I could use to really um, that's a very good point. And in the adaptive scheduling domain, I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, this is certainly has been done for more traditional jobs where uh, the job's total work or even the parallelism is, is more easier, it's easier to get estimated. But that's an interesting question because as far as we can see that a little bit of information bring in a lot of improvement and what those information could fit into this diagram. Yes, please. That's true. Um, if we even draw it all the way back to that, what if we know the entire deck of the job? What can we do? And what kind of bond we see there? And probably from there, we can even extract what are the in important information over there. Yes, please. Empirical point. I know a computing center that figures that when a job is less than 30 seconds to run, give it maximum priority. Yes. It's simply got to crud out of the system faster and improve response time, improve throughput. Absolutely. Um, that, that's a very, that's a great observation because just now when I talk about response time, it's response time in the batched case. Think about response time in non batched case. What would be the best algorithm? In fact, the best offline algorithm will be to running the shortest remaining time first. And the transformation of that into the online system is really to try to give each job the same amount of like previous the, the running time over there. So in other words, it's to say for the when the job just arrived, I want to give them a lot of priority let them run. <coughs> Eventually at priority reduce and I will give it a slightly longer slice of time to run. In fact, this one piece of work along that line and it's able to show that in terms of mean response time in the non-batched case to schedule sequential jobs is log n competitive, which is the best known result along that line. Yes, please. Along that line again, um, for, for the Google Map Reviews paper, one of the, the heuristics they implemented was that near the end of the run, they basically speculatively started off redundant computations. The idea being that some of the things that were lagging behind were lagging behind because 
machine was slow or there's a bottleneck or something like that. And they found that, you know, a sort of small percentage of these dynamic computations actually made a significant reduction in the elapsed time for the entire map reduced computation. Yes. So can we fit this, something like that, other constraints into this type of scheduling model as well? Mm, I don't have a very good answer to this yet. But imagine, I, I know the problem you described because that's, that's what I encountered when I worked as an intern over there. Um, I would think one possibility is once you've been, once you have get to that point, since all of the processors are dedicated to a particular map reduce job, then you could very much exp um, use more of the processors allocated to afford the duplicate work over there. But this idea doesn't fit into adaptive scheduling very well because in adaptive scheduling, <coughs> you might be able to use extra resources somewhere better than to duplicate work and make sure this job will run faster. However, if we change the objective slightly differently and have an overweighted part in terms of job's total completion time, then that option uh, of making, may, maybe doing more duplication on the part of work which just failed and the only remaining part makes sense. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, that's true. That's um yeah. That's a very interesting point. Really good question. Um, we want to implement this into the um, plus plus scheduler. The reason we didn't do that is so at the time when it's developed, really we only have eight core machines, and it simply won't be able to see any difference over there, at least according to our experimental result. The only part we are going to see is probably is like the overhead part. What kind of overhead will be there? And nowadays, I think a lot of people are dedicated to merge, integrate different parallel processing models together. Even, for example, the Silk++, TBB, even OpenMP. Well, then they require a centralized, may not be centralized, one resource layer to do the resource management over there. And I think this model will fit pretty nicely there because it's no longer a dedicated environment for certain kind of job model. Instead, it's all about dynamic multi-threaded model running and they have different, kind, different type of jobs. If the number of calls could go bigger, like 16, 32 calls um, are used more often, the advantage of this adaptive scheduling would show up. But, well, on the other side, the answer is we don't have an implementation yet. So if I think about applications that say run on these big data centers, and I think about right, how would I apply this, one thing, and maybe there's a very simple answer to this, the analysis of a job that is running, say an application that runs on a large data center often never terminates. Yes. Right? It just grows and contracts based on, on the demand being placed on it at a given time. But there's, so there's no, in terms of the analysis, you can't say that there's a termination time. Instead, you think about things in terms of maybe mean and quality of service in some sense. Yes. The, the requests that come and go to this application. Could one redo this analysis? I think you could do something 
uh, that that would have a, another theoretical result, but not involve um, T infinity, right? Just there, because there is no such. Yes, there's no t Yes. Some other quality service. Have you, have you thought about that? Is it, or is it mm. interesting? It it is very. It's very interesting, especially if we are talking about apply this into the the domain of like distributed computing or data centers. It eventually, yes. Mm. I I would imagine at that time the performance measurement. Could be very much different because the mix band, mean response band, probably doesn't make much sense. Especially the mix band, it just doesn't make sense. But if we have another, some other performance metrics, for example, with certain energy consumption level, then what we want, it basically to consider both performance and energy consumption, and. This will still fit into the place, but with respect to the work and critical path, I would say, although the services really never complete, but the service usually is requested to do certain kind of job. So for those small tasks, they still have something measurable there. If it's critical path plus work, I'm not sure, but there must be some kind of measurement there instead of just the service itself sitting there. Yeah. That's an interesting point. Yeah. So when yes. I think about data centers or the, the matrices argument, what, what you have there is a set of constraints that say certain jobs can only run on certain processor nodes, essentially, right? Yes. Um, for my work, I didn't consider that part, but that's certainly a very valid assumption because, in fact, two things probably more very important in MapReduce. One is a proximity of the tasks because you want you really want want to allocate the tasks to those nodes which are close together, so they have interactions between each other, data passing, which will all be less costly. Another thing is memory consumption. That's a two major constraint for MapReduce or in the MapReduce scheduling algorithm. Um, but how to apply this part into adaptive scheduling? There's a, I would say there will be a way, but I can't give out that answer by now. And after I have done this part of work, there are people thinking about, OK, put in the constraint and put in the job dependency into this big picture of adaptive scheduling. Yes, please. So what about other resources like memory? Can you imagine rescheduling being done in a similar way? Um, that's a really tricky question because things like memory and disk, it, it's not exactly working in a similar model as computation. And it's hard to model it in the way we have right now. What, what do you think is probably like a good way to model memory. Just well, of course, the first problem is: Are we talking about demand paging and all that stuff, or are we talking about a two-level memory scheduler? Let's think about a two-level memory scheduler for a minute, where the application has a desire determined by, let's say, a garbage collector. It's a managed language we're running, like Java or C sharp or F sharp or something. It sort of knows how many, how much available memory it has, and it's parallel, so it doesn't really. I mean, it wants its working set to be round. There may be prefetching and things like that, but it's not 
surprised by page faults because that destroys, uh, if you have a large number of processors working also, it really wipes you out, as you know. Right, so, so let's assume we have a two-level scheduler. The GC is, is the one with the desire, right? And it asks the operating system, and the operating system makes a decision based on all the competing desires of all of the applications, maybe in a similar kind of way. The hard thing, of course, is coming up with with, uh, the connection with, with time balance. Yes, yeah, the connection of how efficient that is. Yeah. How would the memory actually affect the performance of my program? Right. Well, one can always measure it, you know. I mean, That's interesting. Don't, don't, don't compute it or, or infer it from anything. Just measure it. That is, take the, take the same approach that a greedy does in some sense. Are you deprived of memory or not? Right? All right? Have you been allocated your desire or not? And if you're not deprived, and you're efficient, that is, the garbage collector's not sitting here with half the memory available to be allocated, that would be, that would be a waste. So I think a lot of the same ideas might apply to, in fact, not just those two resources, but other resources as well. So there is interest in some quarters of Microsoft in an in a idea that, that we should really pursue this two-level scheduling thing and have the operating system allocate resources to jobs. And the jobs should ask for what they want. And maybe or maybe not yet. Yeah, that's true. So that's, that's sort of, oh. but, but you're right, the bounds are tough, are tough uh, I think. I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. So, so, so the connection. I was struck when I saw your A greeting that reminded me in some cases looked like ways uh, Peter Denning used to work on some of the you know, uh, working set optimization models. You know, how do right. you predict working set size for an application? And you see demand for working set, but performance goes down. Yep. You have to page fault. And so you next next round, you, you increase the number of page frames allocated uh, from yep. the total page yep. Yep. But, yeah. but I think you can make a competitive algorithm uh, argument on demand paging in the uni processor. You have one processor. You say, well, what else would you be doing? Well, you have to bring the page in. So if you, you know, if you make the make the overhead sufficiently small by making the working head su sufficiently big, then you can be competitive. Uh, I don't know if anybody's done that, but I, that might be the problem. Is what happens when you have multiple processors? Now, what do you do? Uh, how do you deal with these? Can't demand paging is somewhat suspect. So, but but I think. What I'm trying to say is I think the ideas might be worthwhile even if you can't prove the competitiveness of the memory allocator. That's true. So. And empirically, we, we can certainly do a lot of work along that line. And maybe from some of the empirical results, we can get some ideas on the point that we can't see f by now. And it, it's possible that we can eventually bound it analytically in a certain kind of way. Yes, please. You can build the assumption that each job and each process does its own thing and doesn't bother the other jobs. Where in fact, the biggest thing that a job does is pollute the cash for all the other jobs. And there are multiple processes where they say that one process should be shut down and it doesn't bother the serious process that's actually doing work. Uh, that's true. We assume there's no evil ones. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here.